Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. When prayed, our speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Michael Spiegel. He is Assistant Professor of Theological Studies. After escaping the frigid climate of the northern uh, regions of Minnesota, he attended Philadelphia Biblical University, graduated in 1996, and completed his THM in New Testament at Dallas Seminary in 2001 and finished his Ph.D. in Theological Studies in 2008. He joined our faculty that same year after spending a few years writing for Insight for Living. He's authored and edited numerous popular-level Bible study guides, popular and scholarly articles, and has taught and presented papers both uh, here at home as well as overseas. He lives in Mesquite with his wife, Stephanie. They have three young children, Sophie, Lucas, and Nathan. Would you join me in welcoming to our platform this morning, Dr. Michael Spiegel. Thank you. Several years ago, I worked at a a Christian ministry. I worked in the call center of a Christian ministry, which is sometimes a little different. This is not Insight for Living. This was way before that. The, the call center itself, I wouldn't describe as necessarily Christian. They were Christian-ish. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't anti-Christian. I think that was the requirement to work there. Uh, but I remember walking through the break room one day, minding my own business, when I was sucked into a conversation between two young believers. Uh, one of them was insisting quite vehemently that when Jesus returns in order to fulfill all of his promises and prophecies, he was going to have to die again and then rise again. And the text that he was using to prove his point, uh, he had several, he had them bookmarked, uh, but Luke 18.33, Jesus says, they will kill him and the third day he will rise again. And his reasoning was, in his mind, impeccable. Since he died and rose the first time in order to die, in order to rise again, right? He would have to die again. The worst part about this is no matter how much we appeal to the Greek text or parallel passages that showed he was obviously wrong, he just kept looking at his Bible and saying, you have to deal with this text. You you don't believe the Bible. It says rise again. Ridiculous. (laughs) How did he come up with such strange conclusions? He was unteachable. He was untaught. Those two go hand in hand. And he was unstable. I stumbled on another uh, very unique reading of Scripture. It has major implications for our doctrine of God. Uh, This particular teacher would agree with us and 2,000 years of church history that the Father is God and the Son is God and the Spirit is God. And had he stopped there, things would have been great. But he added and Jerusalem is God. <laughs> Psalm 48, 12 through 14. Walk about Zion, go around her, count her towers, consider her ramparts, go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation. For such is God, our God forever and ever. If that's not enough, Jeremiah 33, 16. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord Yahweh, our righteousness. So very clearly this man insists that Jerusalem is is a member of the, what, quadrinity? (laughs) Yeah, we laugh. It's, It's ridiculous, isn't it? What went wrong? He was unteachable. This is obvious. Uh, But he was untaught. Because he was untaught, he was unstable. And he deceived himself, and he was deceiving others. Thank goodness that we're all smarter than that. We wouldn't fall for such ridiculous, unsophisticated, vulgar, unrefined errors. No. See, our, our errors and our self-deceptions are much more complex, much more refined, much more subtle much more easily defensible. You see, we, we like terms like new and innovative. 
we strive to stand out. We want to uh, ap- appeal to people who love the fresh. I love the word nuanced. I love to be nuanced, <laughs> right? We really ca- applaud people who cleverly handle the word of truth. It's no wonder that many of our evangelical pastors and teachers out there uh, are peddling, preaching and teaching things that for centuries have been regarded as heterodox or, or heresy, things that used to be the proud property of the Gnostics, and they don't even know it because they have their, their texts to back it up. No, we may not say that Jerusalem is God, and we may not claim that Jesus is going to die a second time so He can rise again, Uh, but we have our own little problems, don't we? None of us is beyond the need for teachability. Nobody out here, nobody here. This is why Peter's warning in 2 Peter 3, 16 is particularly important for us. I want you to turn to 2 Peter 3. I'm going to be looking at, starting with chapter, uh, chapter 3, starting with verse 14, and by the time I'm done, we'll get to the end of the book and uh, the end of this, this message. I want to start with verse 14 just to pick up the context. Uh, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in, by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Which things? Well, he just got done talking about the, the coming judgment and explaining why it's delayed for the sake of the salvation of many and talking about the, the new heavens and new earth, that, that renewed creation that's going to be coming afterwards. And he says, since you're looking for these things, be found spotless and blameless. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. This is the early version of footnoting. Verse 16, As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures to their own destruction. I want to spend a few minutes, maybe a few too many, but I want to spend a few minutes asking and answering four questions questions about this text. Number one, what were these people doing, these people who had a problem with Paul and and struggled with Scripture? What were they doing exactly? Number two, why were they doing this? What caused them to do this? Three, what were the results? And four, what does it have to do with us? What are the implications for us? Peter tells us that by being untaught, these people were unstable. Being untaught and unstable brought self-deception and deception of others, and that brought destruction of their faith and called upon them destruction. Not a, not a great goal to set for yourself. First of all, what were they doing in this text? Peter says that they distorted Paul's writings and the rest of the Scriptures. So notice this, they had the Scriptures the Old Testament Scriptures that they were using, and it seems like they had a a good supply of the best canon of the day, Paul's writings and and some other things, and they were reading those. It's not that they were just making things up out of thin air. They weren't apparently writing their own Scriptures. They were using what what the rest of the church was using at the time. But it says that they, they distorted them. The word is strablao. I love that word. Sounds like an Italian dish, you know. Strablao. I'd like a strablao with pepperoni and sausage, please. <laughs> but it's, what does it mean? It means to twist. I like this definition. Uh, one lexicon says, strictly twist or wrench limbs on an instrument for torturing people called a rack. In fact, the word for the rack is related to this term. So metaphorically, they were twisting and turning and, and wrenching the Scriptures. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something, you, and some of you won't do it because you're stubborn. But uh, I want you to take your arm and just put it behind your back, if you can. Don't let your neighbor do it, okay? Put it behind your back. How many of you have had people do this to you as a kid in the playground, in recess, at church, (laughs) seminary? Okay, and you you know, if you do it to yourself, it starts to hurt, doesn't it? That shoulder feels like it's going to come out of your, out of its socket. Now, 
back on the playground, you could get kids to say almost anything. I don't know why we made them say uncle. If I could make people say anything, it wouldn't be uncle. But anyway, uh, you can get them to say almost anything, right? This is what they were doing to the Scriptures. They were twisting it, torturing it, forcing it to say something it didn't really want to say, right? Uh, okay, Jesus is going to die and, and rise again when he comes back. Okay, Jerusalem's God. I'll say anything. Leave me alone, right? <laughs> this is what they were doing to the Scriptures. So to answer our first question, what were they doing? They were doing violence to the text. They were pushing and pulling and squeezing and, and manipulating getting it to say what they wanted it to say. They were twisting the Scriptures. Now, there's this truism. The more clever you are, the more educated you are, the more tools you have on your utility belt, uh, the better you can be at twisting the Scriptures. Okay? The tools that you're acquiring in seminary, uh, exegesis, languages, history, the practical experience, these things can be used to accurately handle the word of truth on one hand or to violently mangle it. It can be used for tools of edification or as weapons of mass destruction. There's nothing more dangerous than knowledge in the hands of a wicked person or a deceived person. So just because you have knowledge and education doesn't mean you're beyond deception. So what were they doing? They were twisting the Scriptures. Why were they doing it? I look at this and I think, why would they, why would they take the Scriptures and twist and deceive? What was motivating them? Well, there are some people, I think, who know that that's not what the Bible says, and say, they say it anyway because it's self-serving. I have a feeling, though, that most teachers out there, false teachers who are engaged in this kind of thing, really think that that's what the Bible says. They, they had some sort of personal experience of illumination. Sometimes they'll actually say that. God told me what this verse means. Where do you go with that person like that? I don't know. To God, I guess. So that they, they've worked themselves into a self, self-deceiving frenzy. It's ignorant deception. They don't know they're deceived, but that's kind of the worst kind, isn't it? They actually think that they are faithfully handling Scripture. But these people in 2 Peter 3.16, I think that they were intentionally avoiding the things they could have done to not be deceived and to not twist the Scriptures. And what is that? Being taught. You see, they were unteachable. They were unwilling to sit under the tutelage of others, those who actually knew what these difficult passages meant. The word here for untaught, it's a Greek word, amathes, not not on my face, amathes, you can say it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I I did a word study of this. I took all the tools that they they desperately spent uh, years trying to train me to, to use, and so I did a word study. I used Bible Works and looked up every occurrence of this word. It took me about two or three seconds because this is the only time it appears in the New Testament and the Septuagint. So, I was stuck with untaught. Then I did, then I broke it up into its component parts. And ah means un, and mathes means taught. (laughs) You get untaught. So, then I did the nasty no-no, and I started digging into its roots, okay? Mathes, it sounds a lot like our word mathetes. They're related. It is the same root. And I started reasoning. A a disciple is someone who is taught. And so an amathes would be someone who is untaught. So when you strike out three times, you pull down the lexicon and just, you give up. So I surrendered to the lexicon, and and here's what this says. Loa nita, amathes, pertaining to one who has not acquired a formal education, and hence with the implication of being stupid and ignorant. So why were they twisting the scriptures? Because they were untaught. They failed to actually undergo the process of discipleship that, by the way, all of the disciples went through. They were discipled by by Jesus. And then they went in turn and and discipled Timothy and Titus and and Clement and Polycarp, some of these names that appear in the early church. And then they passed that on and, and 
We're supposed to be doing that today, passing it on. So the people who wrote the scriptures and taught the scriptures, uh, they knew what the scriptures meant. Why weren't they going to them and learning what these things meant? They had a question. Because they were unteachable. So Peter says that the untaught were unstable. He also says they were marked for deception, or marked by deception and marked for destruction. So at this point, some people may say, uh, so is the Bible difficult to understand? Don't you believe in the perspicuity of Scripture, the plain, uh, uh, that it's plain and easy to, to read and understand? Uh, Peter says, in which are some things hard to understand. He doesn't say everything's hard to understand. He doesn't say they're impossible to understand. They're difficult. They're difficult passages. There are passages that must be fit into a bigger uh, understanding of truth and theology and doctrine and apostolic teaching. These, of course, became the, the primary texts of these false teachers. So I, I do believe wholeheartedly in the sufficiency of Scripture. Okay, don't get me wrong. I do not believe in the sufficiency of me. Just if I, if I were, I'm not going to take my glasses off. I'm afraid I'm going to mess this thing up. But if I were to take my glasses off, these words would be a bit blurry. And I might falsely come to the conclusion that something's wrong with a printer. They, they, they printed a bad set of Bibles. Uh, then I put the glasses on and I realize, oh, no, wait, <laughs> there's something wrong with me. I'm not seeing clearly. So there are things you can do, apparently, to help make Scripture more clear. And what is that? You need to be taught. You need to be discipled. <clears throat> Third question, what was the result of being untaught? Well, because they were untaught, it, it brought instability. And Peter says this brings deception and destruction, ultimately. The word for unstable, it's not, not I don't like it as much as strablao. Uh, asterictos, uh, Loa Nita defined this one as pertaining to the tendency to change and, and waver in one's views and attitudes. So they were ungrounded. They were a little off kilter, maybe a little tipsy, like they had a little too much to drink. They were intoxicated by their own deceptions. When I was a kid, I used to build with Legos. I still do. Uh, a lot. A lot more than I care to admit. <laughs> uh, I love them. They're the best toy. But I, I remember, very clearly remember, the first time I tried to build walls with Legos. And some of you did this. You, you take the blocks and you start stacking them. And pretty soon, you have five columns of parallel blocks. And someone bumps the table and all of a sudden the whole thing collapses. And you try it again and you're trying to figure out what went wrong. Finally, my uncle across the table, he, he finally loses his patience, and he gets up and he comes over to me and he says, three words that revolutionized my wall-building skills. Stagger, don't stack. You stagger them. And all of a sudden, my walls were staying up. You stagger. And then I figured out what those little blocks were for. They were for filling in the ends when you're staggering, right? You know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> The Scripture twisters, they were using the same building blocks of Scripture, but they needed someone to come alongside of them. They needed to go alongside someone and to show them how to put this together to keep from building a structure that was not only unstable and likely to collapse on them and all their disciples, but one that was marked for demolition. Take a look, uh, if you can, it's maybe on the same, same page, depending on how small your font is. Chapter 2, 1 and 3, Paul, uh, Peter uses the same term for destruction here regarding the same category of people, if not the same people themselves. He says, there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. There's your deception. Even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves destroying the faith of others and destroying themselves in the process. In verse 3, he says, In their greed, they will exploit you with false words, deception. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. 
So what's the result of being untaught and unteachable? They were unstable. Because they were untaught and unstable, they were self-deceived. They deceived others. They destroyed people's faith, and they themselves were marked for destruction. What were they doing? They were twisting the Scriptures. Why were they doing it? They were untaught. They were unstable. What's the result? Deception and destruction. Widespread deception and destruction. So finally, what does this mean for us? Now, obviously, to some degree, to a large degree, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, right? All of you, I'm assuming most of you at least, are here to be taught. Why else would you be here? You believe that Bible training and theology and history and backgrounds and languages and all of these things uh, are important and vital in, in understanding and living the Scriptures and teaching those and discipling others. I'm assuming that's the case. So how does this exhortation to be taught apply to us who are being taught? Well, let me, let me go underneath that being taught. There's such a thing as sitting in a class and getting a degree and not being taught because being taught requires being teachable. This is the biggest problem. It's not that the disciples said, go away, we don't have time for you. Don't ask that question. I wrote the text. I don't even know what it means. They weren't saying that. It was their unteachability that made them untaught. What does it take to be teachable? I think it takes two things. It takes humility, something that's often a rare commodity, and it takes patience, something that's a really rare commodity. Teachability uh, uh, takes humility. You may be pursuing or about to, be, about to receive or may have a Master of Theology degree or a Master of Arts degree or a PhD. Don't kid yourself. Don't think for a second that that makes you beyond deception, beyond talking yourself into something. Some of the greatest Scripture twisters in history had just as much, if not more, education than all of you. The more knowledge you have, in fact, the more humility you need. This especially manifests itself here at the seminary. Not just this one, any seminary. But uh, in two ways, I see lack of humility. They're two opposite ends of a spectrum, in fact. But lying under this is this, this lack of humility. One is the person who has come to seminary having it all figured out. They think they know it all. This, this, is, this is also, and I'm going to say it because I was one, the Bible college brat. Not everybody from Bible college is a Bible college brat. I was when I got here. I was like, eh, I'm not going to get anything out of this class. They are not going to tell me anything new. I've heard it all before. Don't waste my time. The questions uh, from people like this who are, have this unteachable attitude, they raise their hand and they say, Dr. So-and-so, don't you really think that dot, dot, dot? No, I don't, but apparently you think I should. So why don't you come up here? Why don't you make your own PowerPoint presentations and get your own class? <laughs> remember, uh, uh, this is not to name drop, but... Uh, I remember I had uh, Ryrie for soteriology back at Bible college, and when someone would disagree with him too much, he said, he'd just say, well, write your own book. <laughs> <laughs> write your own book if you don't like it. <laughs> Thankfully, the know-it-alls are a minority, okay? But uh, some, of you, some of you may drift to the other extreme over here where, where you don't know it all, and you know you don't know it all, and you're scared to let anybody know you don't know it all. Or you have issues in your life that make it very difficult for you to learn and to study and to, and to absorb this, but you don't want to tell anybody. You're afraid to raise your hand and, and stand out in your ignorance because you lack the humility to expose your ignorance. You see, 
It's, it's essentially the same thing. Some of you, in other words, need to raise your hand a lot more than you do in class. And others of you need to not raise it as much. Hopefully, most of you are there in the middle. I'm assuming that's the case. But a teachability takes humility. It also takes patience. This implies endurance and perseverance, all of those things that are wrapped up in patience. Being taught, being taught the things you really need to know to understand Scripture right, to put it in a, a theological and historical context, uh, that takes time. It takes more than a, a year or two. It takes more than three or four or ten or, or even a lifetime. I've had conversations with members of the faculty here that I, I, I would think, man, they, they have it all figured out at least. At least they have a, a clear a definite view on something, and then I'll say, well, what do you think of 1 John? And what do... Oh, man, ooh, I wrestle with that one. That's, that's actually encouraging that 1 John gives them a hard time too. So, again, it takes a lot of time. It involves endurance. Boy, don't we know it. It takes effort. It takes work. It takes stress. It takes tears. Some of you have, have started out in a particular program here, and, and you got to seminary, and you're all glassy-eyed and excited. <laughs> you know, nobody sins at seminary. Everything's relevant. And you get there, and after a couple semesters, you're worn out. You're weary. You want to give up. You start adding up your, your classes and credits and, to see, what can I dump this into to get out of here? Where can I transfer this to cut my program short? Or you start rationalizing, oh, there's a ministry out there that's waiting for me. i got to get this done. I thought the THM or I thought the PhD was, was important, but it, it really isn't. I need to get out there and do ministry. They're desperate for people like me. <laughs> Think, if you're trying to rush out from under this, taking the quick and easy route, think twice about this. I'm not saying it's always inappropriate, because it's not always, but you're here for a reason, and being teachable and being taught takes time. It takes energy. It takes money. Think twice about that. Don't rush to this kind of decision. It reminds me, uh, it reminds me of a scene from The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, yes, I am about to quote Yoda, the Jedi Master. <laughs> Some of you may remember it. If you don't, <laughs> I'll get them to watch Star Wars yet. If you don't remember it, uh, there's something wrong with you. Okay. <laughs> it's, when, it's when Luke Skywalker is training on that swampy planet, and he's just graduated from picking up little pebbles to picking up little stones, and he, he has this premonition. None of this is real, by the way, okay? I'm not saying there are people having premonitions and picking up stones. But he has this, he sees that his friends are in danger, so what does he do? He cuts his training short, and he rushes and gets in his ship, and he's loading up, and Yoda's mad at him. Of course, Yoda's his master, and he's trying to teach him to be a good Jedi. And Yoda says this, and I'm not going to do a Yoda voice, trust me. But he has this, his great quote. If you end your training now, if you choose the quick and easy path, as Vader did, you will become an agent of evil. Now look, you're not, well, you might, but you're probably not going to become an agent of evil. <laughs> but if you're untaught, and you're unstable, and you're more and more prone to self-deception, uh, you could become an agent of instability. You could become an agent of, of deception. You could become an agent of destruction. If you don't believe me, turn on your TV. You only have to flip a few channels before you can see it happening. So hang in there. Being teachable and being taught is not quick. It's not easy. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes money. It takes patience. It takes humility. But it's worth it. This brings me to the end. Some of you are thinking, thank goodness this is over. I want to end with Peter's own exhortation. He actually finishes talking about these people who have a problem with Paul and, and twist the Scriptures. And then he says this. 
and we'll end here. He says, you therefore, beloved, in light of what we just got done talking about, this warning, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men. You can be deceived. You can be carried away. You can, be, you can carry yourself away. Not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, the instability, the tripping up, the destruction. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.